Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to another outstanding City Club Forum. My name is Susan Kelly, President of the Club. Today we have the opportunity to fully understand the impact of our votes on November 5th. Pollster and public opinion analyst Tim Hibbets of Davis Hibbets and McCaig is with us to provide a general perspective and answer our questions, and they better be good, hard questions. Friday, November 15th, join us for a special panel presentation on the ep economic impacts of Oregon's wine industry. Our presenters will be Dick Ponzi of Ponzi Vineyards, Jim Bernau of Willamette Valley Vineyards, Karen Hinsdale, president of The Cellar Door, and Lynn Penner Ash of Penner Ash Wine Cellars, and that is here at the Multnomah Athletic Club. Please note that our annual fundraising campaign is well underway, and though we're, o we're over halfway to our goal of 100,000, we definitely need help. The first half is always the easiest to raise. So whether you're a club member or a guest here who appreciates the benefits of City Club, please consider a donation. There's pledge, card pledge cards on the table today, and we certainly need your gift. Actually, I, I'm just back from three weeks vacation in Ireland, and I left probably the driest, most beautiful October in the history of <laughs> recorded history of Oregon weather and was in the wettest, wettest Irish October. But it's good to be back. It's good to be back. Um, anyone interested in obtaining a video or audio tape of this or other City Club programs, please do so uh, by calling the office. With Suzanne will take care of your request. $10 for audio and 20 for video. Our board host seated at the head of the table is Chris Smith. He is a member of the Board of Governors and a lead internet technologist for Xerox printing business. He will have the um, uh, privilege of asking the first question of our speaker. And following Chris's question, we will open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone on the floor even before Chris is finished so that we have time to ask as many questions as possible. Identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds. Please, no speeches. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from the following, Pacific Corps, Pope and Talbot, and Weyerhaeuser Company Foundation. We are grateful for their support. Our speaker today is Tim Hibbets, um, a Portlander, he says, as of about age 14, um, when he moved to Portland from Ohio. Tim is a partner in Davis, Hibbets, and McCaig. They are a market and public opinion, research, and strategic communication firm. They do way more beyond politics and work with corporate co clients, electronic and print media, and the public sector. They do survey research on candidates and ballot measures, and have Tim has been immersed in this work since 1978. Uh, their firm is sought out nationally um, by the likes of the Washington po Post and Time Magazine, and of course locally by the Oregonian and um, uh, Channel 2 KTU TV. Um, there is a little piece of information I would love to have something, that there is a side consulting business that Tim has for which there is no charge. Um, Tim is an avid and devoted backpacker, wilderness outdoorsman, and so there's a select few who have come to Tim and maybe bought lunch to get advice on where's the next greatest adventure. And I'm sure if you agree to a 50-pound pack and 50 miles a day, he will be glad to share some ideas with you. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. Uh, I do want to correct you at the end, though. In a concession to age, it's now only 40, 40 miles a day in a 40-pound pack. <laughs> so uh, we'll go easy on you. I'll, I'm, it's been a while since I've been here. It's nice to be back. Uh, my ground rules for speaking are pretty simple. I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'd like to get a lot of great questions, which I know I will get from this crowd. One thing I want to emphasize is that I normally adjust my uh, my insult level to the audience that I'm addressing. Um, if I'm in front of a conservative audience, I usually like to poke them a little more. If I'm in front of a liberal audience, I like to poke them a little bit more. So uh, I have a hunch there aren't too many conservatives left in the city club. So um, we should have some fun today. Uh, all right, thank you, Ned. Well, you know what I say. Uh, I, uh, I followed the old Winston Churchill adage, uh, uh, that if a person's not a liberal at age 20, they've got no heart, and if they're not a conservative at age 40, they have no brains. So, uh, 
but seriously, thanks for the invite. I'm looking forward to a, a lively session. I'd like to start with kind of an overview of what we saw nationally in, and in Oregon, and then uh, we'll get to the questions. Uh, uh, most of you, obviously, all of you, I'm sure, know now that the uh, Republicans, one, regained control of the uh, uh, United States Senate. They made narrow gains off of their majority in the House of Representatives. Uh, and it, it was not the number of seats won, clearly, because there wasn't that much, uh, a few seats is not a dramatic shift in the House, uh, but rather uh, it's the fact that the Senate flipped to the Republican side from the Democratic side, uh, and that the Republicans clearly broke the uh, tradition of the in-party presidential party losing House and Senate seats in the first year, or the first election after that individual had been elected, or in the case of George W. Bush, so sort of elected. Um, <laughs> Um, so I think that's really the story. The Republicans vastly exceeded the expectations uh, that were placed upon them in this election, and I think uh, by any measure, uh, nationally, it was, a, it was a very good night for them. But I would say in 26 years of watching uh, politics and getting paid for it, um, this was probably the most bifurcated election I've ever seen, and I'd like to explain that uh, briefly. George Bush nationalized the federal elections. He nationalized the congressional elections and the, the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House elections in certain spots very much to the Republican benefit. And I think their strategy was very good at that. Um, and uh, for those Democrats, uh, elitist Democrats, who uh, like to snicker at George Bush's intellect, I've got some bad news for you. He's a lot smarter than you think he is. Uh, and uh, uh, you should keep that in mind when you, look, when you uh, size up to 2004. Um, for all of that, I don't think by any stretch he's a lock in 2004. Uh, there's a lot to happen, uh, occur be, uh, between now and then. The keys are going to be the economy, whether or not Americans feel safe in their own country uh, after what happened on September 11th of last year and what could still obviously happen in the future, uh, and uh, what he does in the realm of foreign policy. It's very clear that while I think the president has a slim majority of the country behind him on, the, on Iraq, he does not have a substantial majority. And if things go wrong in that, uh, or he decides to move into Iraq and things don't go well, I think that the political repercussions could be, could be enormous for him. Uh, a couple of other observations I make quickly on the national level. It's very interesting. Another reason why, again, I think uh, the people around George Bush and George Bush are a lot smarter than a lot of liberals gave him credit for is, if you look at the kind of candidates they recruited this year who won in many of these seats, they're not the dyed-in-the-wool arch conservative who came in in the 1994 Republican sweep. Most of them are, they're certainly conservative, but they fall into what I would very much call a broad centrist conservatism, not, an, not a radical ideology, ideolo a radically ideological conservatism. Um, so I don't think the Republicans are likely to overreach the way they did in 1994. When they came into office after the big sweep in the 1994 election, a lot of these fellows who'd been elected, ladies and gentlemen, who'd been elected on a 51 to 49 percent margin suddenly thought that they had a mandate for radical change. They didn't have that mandate. And in many respects, you, it's impressive that the Republicans have been able to hold on to the majority over the last three elections. Another question that I'm looking for on a national level, uh, before we move now to uh, here, uh, here a little bit more, is uh, that, well, the Democrats, you know, the Democrats are already questioning uh, the tactics that they had. We shouldn't have gone along with Bush on Iraq. We should have done this. We should have done that. And what I'm going to be watching to see if the, Repub if the Democratic Party on a national level says we need to uh, offer more of a choice, not an echo, and try to push the party more to the left. Uh, my personal guess is that might work in here and there, uh, but it's not probably a very good prescription for winning a national election. But again, it remains to be seen, and a point I would make is that people are going to react to the government they get over the next two years. If the economy is not in good shape in the fall of 2004, if we've had further incidents, uh, terrorist incidents on our own soil, and people feel like this administration cannot protect them, George Bush will probably lose. So anyone who looks at this election as some sort of mandate for Bush uh, or suggests that Bush is unbeatable in 2004, I don't share that perspective at all. Now, when I said this was a bifurcated election, what I meant was if you go to the state level, the individual states, and we'll get to Oregon in a minute, 19 of the 36 states that had, Canada, that had governor's races had a party switch. 
went from Republican to Democrat, from Democrat to Republican, or in a couple of instances went from independent to either Democrat or Republican. Over half of the governorships that were up showed a party switch. The, to my knowledge and recollection and the records that I looked at, far and away the highest switch I've ever seen. And the reason is simple. In a lot of these states, voters are not happy with what's going on. And a lot of analysts, and I would include myself in that, assumed that that probably would have meant that the Democrats would have gained a little bit even in the Congress and the Senate. But it, it didn't work out that way again because I think Bush successfully nationalized the federal elections to his advantage. But on the state level, what usually happens when people are unhappy with the w direction of the way things are going played out the way it pretty much normally does, which is a lot of income, a, a number of incumbents lost, and a number of in-party governorships, even if they didn't have an incumbent running, switched to the other party. Classic question we ask in this state and all the polls that we ask, are things headed in the right direction or are they off on the wrong track? Well, right now in Oregon, a two and a half to one margin says things are off on the wrong track. And, uh, and that is, the I suspect, the same thing you would be looking at in a lot of these other states that had party switches. So in other words, the voter frustration came out of one level, which was against the, the state government, but came out much less, I think, at, at, at the federal level. Um, that brings us to Oregon, and I'll quickly dismiss the uh, U.S. Senate race. I, I heard we had one. Um, <laughs> Gordon Smith positioned himself. You know, he learned from losing the first time around. The first time he ran, you may remember, in his very close race, race with Ron Wyden, he ran as an ideological conservative. He lost narrowly. Uh, he ran as kind of continuing the, the Gingrich Revolution, and that was, remember, only a year after the Republican sweep of 1994. Next time he ran, when he ran against... Uh, uh, Tom, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Berger, thank you. Tom somebody or other. Um, he won, but he moderated his message. Some of you here may remember this famous sweater ad where he promised women that he wasn't going to be a one-issue candidate on choice. He, even though he was pro-life, he was not going to uh, be a one-issue candidate on that. So he learned that if you're a Republican in this, this state, the best way to get elected, you can get elected as a conservative, but you have to be in the broad center. It is very difficult for a strongly ideological conservative to win in this state. If you want to go to Utah or Idaho or Texas, you can win that way. In Oregon, it's going to be extremely difficult to win that way. So what we saw in the race was basically, we must have polled it 10, 12 times over the course of a year. It was never close. Our numbers had uh, 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 Smith between, ahead between 15 and 22 or 23 percentage points the whole way and uh, uh, he wound up winning by about 16 or 16 and a half points. And the one observation I would make is I think this could have been a much more competitive race, but the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee hung Bill Bradbury out to dry. They promised they were going to give him a lot of help, and they didn't. They gave him some help. They went and spent money on, on uh, uh, trying to prop up the corrupt Bob Torcelli in New Jersey until they realized he couldn't win, and then they decided they'd bail out on him. But they spent a lot of money in places, I think, uh, that could have been better spent. I'm not saying, let me be clear, I'm not saying Bill Bradbury would have won here, but I think he could have been competitive, and it certainly wouldn't have been a 17-point race. But to have done that, they would have had to have made a strategic decision early that they were going to play in a big way, and they didn't do that. Governor's race, uh, very interesting one, uh, wound up at about 49 to 46 percent, a three-point spread for Ted Kulingowski, strongly polarized by area. Uh, uh, the governor-elect won only eight counties, uh, Multnomah County by 87,000 votes. He lost the rest of the state by 54,000 votes. Um, so we've got basically, uh, it's going to make it tougher for him to govern. I'm not saying he, he can't govern, but he's a plurality winner, and he's a guy who won in eight counties and basically got wiped off the board in most of the rest of the state. I will say I, I, I think that Ted Kulingowski has the kind of personality and the ability to reach out to folks across the state and even to those on the other side of the aisle that give him at least the opportunity uh, to be successful. But it's going to be tough, at, particularly given all of the other problems he's facing. Uh, I really think uh, that the Mannix folks ran a better campaign than the Kulingowski folks, uh, but I'd also make a couple of observations. Uh, uh, you know, uh, being an independent pollster, I have a foot in both camps, and I get a chance to hear the perspectives of both sides. Um, and I heard a lot of griping from Democrats that how, what a lousy campaign Kulingowski ran. I don't think he ran a lousy campaign. I think Mannix ran a better campaign, but I would make the observation, Ted Kulingowski's strategy was a lot, his strategic options were a lot more limited. Remember, we had an electorate in this state saying things are not going very well now. What was he supposed to do? Dump on his own governor? Say, you know, the voters are right. John Kitzhaber has been a, a miserable governor. Uh, he couldn't do that. He couldn't really even criticize the direction of the state that much. So I think, frankly, what they did, and it wasn't that bad of a strategy because it wound up winning, was to do what they did in the primary, which was to go into a turtle shell and hope that their lead held on. And it did hold on. Um, 
So again, you can get on his case about that and say, well, he didn't say anything or this or that or the other thing, but I actually think it might well have been the best strategy that they had. As I said, I ask you, again, you, you have an electorate that is change-oriented in Oregon, unhappy with the way things are going. Kulingowski, by inference, has to defend 16 years of Democrat, as, as, as uh, Kevin Mannix said, 16 years of Democratic uh, leadership in the governor's office. And it's, it, Ted Kulingowski simply couldn't come out and repudiate that 16 years. You can't say, well, again, my party's done a terrible job and, and, and the voters are right to be angry. So I really think Kulingowski's options were a lot more limited. Mannix, were much, Mannix had much more room to room. In addition to uh, the tax issue, which I think did help Mannix, uh, he also had the change-oriented message, which was, if you're happy with the way things are going, Kulingowski is your guy. If you're not happy with the way, way things are going, maybe you ought to shake him up a little bit. I think one mistake Mannix may be made, and again, it's easy to be critical about it, is uh, that Probably they could have done a better job of using the tax issue, not so much as an ideological issue only, which is what they used it as, and it helped them to bring home Republicans, but rather to use it as an, in a way that said, you know, this is the typical kind of thinking that we're getting out of Salem these days. The state gets into trouble, they ask for more money. Why don't they think about things? Why don't they do things or look at things in a different way? Households in Oregon are having to cut back because of this recession. When's the state government going to get it? And I didn't really see that connection there until uh, the very end of the campaign. But again, on balance, I think Mannix uh, did a better job than Kulingowski, but I also, also think he had a lot more room uh, to maneuver. Uh, Cox did not cost Mannix the, Mannix the election. Maybe one or two of you read the Oregonian and saw the piece I had in there today. Uh, it's now become a Republican urban legend that Cox's 4.5% was Mannix's vote. Completely absurd. You know, one of the fascinations I have in politics is studying third party movements. I really enjoy them. I was an Oregon and Oregon State football fan for a long time, so you can understand why <laughs> I have a I have a pension I have a pension for lost causes. Uh, things have been better the last few years. Um, but um, a couple of points I'd make about that, and that is when folks vote for a third party candidate, sometimes they're really voting for that candidate. They like him or her and they like the platform that that party offers. But for a lot of, time, a lot of times, and at least for a portion of third party voters, that third party candidate is the functional equivalent of none of the above. I don't like Gulagowski, I don't like Mannix, but I am going to vote. Why not just toss a vote out for uh, Cox? He's not going to get elected and it's a good way to cast a protest vote. Uh, there are really a limited number of things you can do if you're unhappy with the two major party candidates. You can write in a candidate. You can leave the ballot blank, as about 2% of Oregonians who voted did in the governor's race, did not vote at all for anyone. Um, the, the second fallacy, so a lot of those votes, the point I would make is probably about half of the, the uh, uh, Cox vote was not there for anyone to get because it was, it was simply, I don't like either of the other two candidates, uh, why not toss a vote here? The second point I would make is that if you understand the concept of genuine libertarianism or near libertarianism, it is get out of my life. It doesn't mean it's okay to tax me, or excuse me, it doesn't mean I don't want you to tax me, but it's okay for you to try to regulate my personal life. It means get out of my life. Mannix was on the wrong side of those social issues. I'm not arguing he's good or right, right, wrong, or indifferent on them. The fact of the matter is he, is he was culturally conservative in ways that collided directly with, the, with true libertarianism. So that the idea that the Mannix people had that, well, they'll give us a pass on all the cultural stuff because we're right with them on tax and spending issues was just baloney. And uh, I think they were chasing, as I said in the paper this morning, the, uh, to chase those libertarian votes for Mannix and to say that, well, this is why we lost, is like the political equivalent of fool's gold. And culturally conservative Republicans who continue to chase the one to two to three percent of hard libertarians in the state and think they're going to get them because they agree with them on tax issues are, are wasting their time. Um, a couple of other quick points. Uh, from my view, if the Republicans had nominated Jack Roberts or Ron Saxton, uh, either of those gentlemen would be governor-elect today. Um, very similar to California, by the way. If they'd run Richard Reardon instead of uh, uh, Simon against Gray Davis, one of the most spectacularly unpopular governors ever to grace the country, uh, they would have won those races. But Republicans, uh, in their infinite wisdom, love to nominate the candidates with the least chance of winning. And they did that here in Oregon. And let me be clear, uh, Kevin Mannix ran a good race, but he just gave up some things just because of the nature of who he is that made his job a lot tougher. And he took a 15 to 20 point race and cut it down to three percentage points. So I think he deserves credit for that, but that still doesn't move me off my perspective that either the other two gentlemen who were in the Republican primary would have had a, be had a much better shot at winning that race. 
Um, again, very quickly, Kulingowski led by 15 points or so after the primary. He led by about 10 on Labor Day. By the end of September, it was down to five. And then the race kind of went into sort of a stasis or uh, kind of locked down for several weeks uh, and didn't move very much at all until I think in the last few days, Mannix picked up a little bit more ground. Our last poll had it a six point race. Uh, and uh, I think Mannix made up a little bit more ground at the end, but not enough to make the difference up. Legislature, Republicans won most of the close races. Democrats won only one state Senate seat, uh, while uh, I think they'll probably wind up controlling because of uh, potential bringing uh, uh, Lynn Hannon over. Uh, all in all, the Republicans beat expectations, uh, I think. Uh, the expectations, uh, the scuttlebutt was that Democrats would have an outright majority in the Senate. So one, and one could argue that they probably beat the expectations here, and it wasn't a bad night for him for them. The uh, marvelous redistricting, partisan redistricting plan that was put together by Bill Bradbury uh, didn't help the Democrats as much as I thought it would. Uh, tax stuff, about two-thirds of the school tax-related issues failed on election night. Uh, I think about 17 to 25 is the last count. Uh, here in the People's Republic, though, people did vote yes on three tax increases. Um, and uh, as did the city of Eugene on a school, on a school tax increase. Uh, no surprise, liberal constituencies are more likely to raise taxes. Uh, and Eugene and Portland are liberal constituencies. But I will say to wrap up very quickly that that doesn't bode well for the income tax increase measure in January. The polling we had showed it trailing by somewhere in the 20 percentage point range with a very hard vote against it of about 50 percent. So I don't, uh, 26 years in politics has taught me it's foolish to say the word impossible or can't happen. But what I would say is for the chance of that thing to pass in, in January is extremely long. And I said a month ago, it was very likely or, or very possible that the electorate could elect Kulingowski and then turn right around and, and vote no on the tax increase that he, he supported. And I think that's far and away the most likely outcome. Uh, I'm ready to take any questions you have. Thank you, Tim. Uh, as a progressive, uh, I've been looking for any bright spots coming out of this election. Uh, they're few and far between, uh, but I'm going to ask Tim about a couple of them. Uh, one was the election of David Bragdon and Brian Newman to the Metro Council, and I think that signals a pretty clear direction on the council for the next several years, and I'd love to hear Tim's thoughts on that. Uh, but as people here at City Club know, the initiative process is one of my uh, pet subjects, and my main question is about that. Uh, this was an interesting election season for the initiative process, the first one in a long time where Bill Sizemore had nothing uh, on the ballot at all and, in fact, is facing legal troubles uh, in the civil sphere from the Attorney General and probably will have the IRS auditing him for the next few years. Uh, at the same time, two labor-funded initiatives uh, passed pretty uh, well, one closely, uh, one a little more strongly, uh, yet two other progressive measures went down uh, that had well-funded uh, opposition campaigns and Lauren Parks came very close to passing his two judicial reform measures. So uh, I guess my question is, are we seeing a shift in the initiative landscape? Is this just a lull in the process or is there uh, a permanent um, difference that's been made by some of the court decisions now with the, the uh, limitation on gathering signatures or paying for signatures um, by the signature? Uh, is this a shift or just a, a temporary phenomenon? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I'll address the first one, which was the bragdon Sheely race. Um, I think that wound up about 58 to 42 or 57 to 43 uh, percent. David Bragdon had the wealth of resources. Uh, he had more resources and I think endorsements. Um, I'd actually look at it a little bit. I think uh, that was more a function of name recognition than it was of anything else. Uh, and, and that's not to take anything away from David, who's a very bright guy and I think is going to do a great job. But I also would think that uh, had the money in that race been equal, uh, the outcome uh, probably would have been a lot closer, and I'm not even sure it would have been guaranteed of, of winning. The reason being, uh, we've got, a, again, a political climate which is looking to change. And if Sheely had a, had a lot of money to get out a message of, let's shake Metro up, uh, that might possibly have, have squeezed her over the top. Um, so I don't t read too much into that. Um, on the second one, you know, very little is permanent in politics. Uh, so I wouldn't say that, that this year represented any kind of a permanent shift, but I would say this, I mean, I think uh, probably Bill Sizemore is a spent force in Oregon politics. He may not recognize that yet, but I suspect he is. Um, but that doesn't mean there won't be other activists, anti-tax activists, anti-government activists. There's always going to be room for that. Uh, and I'm not sure within reason that's an unhealthy thing. Um, 
but what I would say is uh, it's a fractured group now, clearly. You have several people. You know, they have their own ego battles in, in those kind of, you know, who's going to be the king of the hill of, or queen of the hill of the anti-government crowd. So um, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it waxes and wanes. Uh, some years it's a stronger trend. Uh, people are more angry about government, so they're more, more interested in those things. Other years it's less so. Uh, and I think it really just had a more, this year had a more of a function to do with a lot of the other things that were going on uh, than any kind of an overall trend uh, that suggested, well, gosh, uh, you know, people are less interested in voting on, on initiatives or less interested in seeing these things on the ballot. But that's still good news. I mean, maybe temporary good news, but it's good news. Hi, Jane. Hi, Tim. How are you? I'm so glad you're here. Jane C., City Club member. Um, actually, you started earlier than 1978. That's because true. you worked on mine and Joyce's campaign. But that's not my I question. I don't remember much about um, the 70s. So. Um, anyhow, <laughs> I, I have a sort of a mushy question. Um, yes. So bear with me for 30 seconds only. Um, it's about the role of um, uh, gender and, the mon and minorities in both national elections and Oregon um, in terms of turnout or uh, candidates as well. It's noticeable that in the Oregon legislative races, women Democrats did abysmally. Um, and I wonder if you have any words of uh, wisdom or advice or analysis on those. I have words. I don't know if they have any wisdom in them. Um, <laughs> they I don't, always do. I, Jane, I don't think you can read anyone in, too much in one election. What I will say is this. We are in, in an irreversible trend in this country where you're going to see more women elected. But I mean long term. I don't mean in any one election you might see a dip down or women could take, you know, could take more losses than expected. But over time, there's just no question you're going to have more women elected from both parties. You're going to have more minorities elected and not just African Americans but also uh, Hispanics as their political clout grows. So what I would say is I don't read too much into the fact that women candidates lost this year because I'm trying to watch a longer term trend which says more women in state legislators, more women, uh, more women in state legislatures, more women getting elected to various offices. So I just think that's an irreversible trend. But that doesn't mean it's not going to take dips. There aren't going to be great years and then there aren't going to be years that, that are not so good. But the, the turnout question also on other candidates in, in national and state elections of women and minorities, is there anything that we can yet see? No, I, I've not seen tell? the exit poll data released yet. Uh, it is possible that in some states, for example, the theory was that, you know, for example, in Florida, uh, African Americans did not turn out and that, if not, didn't make the difference, but boosted the size of Jeb Bush's margin from several points to 13 or 14 points. That may be so. The argument that women, uh, I've seen no statistical data yet that's, that says that women voted in smaller numbers this time around than they did before. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen it, and I'm a little bit suspect of that. I think that there are other reasons, again, for why the election, as I said, turned out, and I don't think it was because, uh, at least in the case of women, that they didn't get their base out. Aubrey Russell, City Club member. I uh, Coletta, a hike with Hi, Aubrey, Tim uh, this spring. I can test the fact it's a very difficult way to get any uh, any uh, words from Tim. He was at least a half an hour ahead of me by the time uh, <laughs> we, we made it at the top of Hamilton Mountain. Um, I'm hoping that you can give some um, historical perspective on what it means in this state to have a mandate, really, given uh, the media and and especially marketing. Um, you have a your privileged in that you know what people in different parts of the state think and what they intend when they're voting for a candidate. Um, we saw in this last election where candidates, this is for statewide races, were saying one thing on the west side and a totally different thing on the, on the west side. So they were two different candidates in the form of a single person. They're, they're elected. Um, and You're going to name any names? No. <laughs> and. Uh, what is uh, what is what is what is their real mandate? And and here's a, a somewhat harebrained idea, maybe, but I don't know if um, the state, of course, um, has a role in in in, in uh, managing elections. Um, would there be a way to approach the legislature during this se this session to talk about about um, political advertising and and consistency of message, um, east, west, north, south? That's an uh, interesting question. Uh, first is that uh, you can't legislate that. I mean, I assume it would immediately run into First Amendment problems. And, and Aubrey, the other observation I'd make is, you know, politicians 
of the left and the right have shaded their message to fit their audience since long before you and I were born and will continue to do that long after you and I are gone. So I, 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 it doesn't bother me. I, it'd be one thing if you said, you know, and if you say in Baker County I'm pro-life and in Portland say you're pro-choice, that's, that's a, uh, clearly creates some problems. But I think on balance, I mean, candidates are going to emphasize issues in areas where they think that's, that's going to help them. Uh, so I don't have a, you know, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, I don't have a huge problem with that as long as uh, I emphasizing different issues in different places. Now, saying one thing in one place and one thing in another place is another matter, and I don't know what the, the you know, I don't know how you get at that, that question. As I said, uh, uh, I think the few court cases, the court cases have, that have come up have said basically, you know, and you can, political advertising is pretty much unfettered advertising, so they're going to have a right to say pretty much what they want, and if they run an ad in Boise that hit, hits Eastern Oregon that says one thing and run an ad in Portland that says something else, I'm not sure what you can do to stop that. Hi, I'm Laura Koistinen from Lincoln High School's Constitution team. Being as how many of my teammates are almost 18, we were wondering why you think Measure 17 failed to pass. Well, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, uh, probably it was older people like me who've had to deal with teenagers who, who, who were, it was our, it was our revenge. But seriously, I, I'm not sure. You know, in Oregon, is, uh, the couple of times this issue has come up. Um, for example, uh, a long time ago, we voted on, uh, in 1970, on allowing 19-year-olds to vote, and that was defeated by a pretty substantial margin. And then we passed a constitutional amendment within the year or two after that that gave 18 to 21-year-olds the right to vote on a, on a national basis, not just in individual states. I don't have an answer to your question. That's probably uh, not what you wanted to hear. The best thing I could surmise is that whatever, for whatever reason, a majority of voters determined that 19 maybe was a little bit too young to be a legislator, though why they would think 22 is is a bit puzzling to me, but that's about the best shot I can take it for uh, at it for you. Yes, Carol Witherell, City Club member. There are lots of theories as to why people aren't voting, um, so I'm wondering what your polls are saying about why so many Oregonians are not voting, and also what your personal hunches are about that, and what would turn it around. Well, that's a good question. And, you know, for a, for a significant number of folks who are e even eligible to vote, they just don't care. And nothing is ever going to make them care. And that's unfortunate, but it's true. Uh, and I say that whether your politics lean right or lean left, you know, you should be active and involved in your community. And voting, it seems to me, is a minimum thing that you ought to do. But I also think there are more broader systemic problems as well beyond the lumps on the log. Again, no matter how active or exciting a campaign is, there are going to be a slice of people who just don't care. Politics doesn't matter to me. I don't know. I don't care. Um, but I also think there are a lot of voters who have been turned away from the system for a variety of reasons. One is maybe they don't feel like that the parties offer enough choices or there's enough difference between the parties. Maybe they're more out on, on the wings and don't see, they see that it's all a broad, mushy middle. Uh, for some folks, I think they are turned off by the advertising. You know, uh, unfortunately, you know, politics is not a non-contact sport. Uh, I don't have a problem, having pr practiced it, I don't have a problem with comparison and negative advertising up to a point. What's happened, though, I think in the last couple of decades that's somewhat different is it's gone beyond you're wrong on the issue to character set, you know, literally the attempt is not to draw the issue differences, it's simply to destroy the, the character of the other individual. And both parties are equally guilty of this, uh, uh, and they'll do what it takes to win. I guess you can point the finger at the consultants, people like me who used, you know, I, I'm innocent now because I don't work campaigns, but I, I'll plead guilty in the past, uh, who tell the candidates to run negative ads, and then ultimately it's the candidate's decision to, to do that. But again, I, I want to be clear, I don't think contrast ads are a problem. That's fair. You're, there are differences in politics between candidates in intra-party battles and between Republicans and Democrats when you get to a general election. But we've reached a st state, I think, where basically, you know, political, uh, you, it's not, the intent is not to win, it's just to, to smash the other person's character. That, I think, keeps a lot of people who would be interested in running from running. Uh, I shouldn't, sure wouldn't want my past exposed. Um, and. Uh, I think that's a problem that, that you have, and I think that, so to get at your question elliptically, I think that turns off some voters who say, you know, probably they're right about what they say each other. They're both a couple of bums. What's in it for me? So I, I, that's what I see. Steve Novick, City Club member. Tim, some of my colleagues in the turtle camp have asked me to speak in defense of turtles and remind you of the story of the tortoise well, so and the was hare. I. So <laughs> was I. Uh, but my question is this. 
The legislature has laid out a series of cuts that will take effect if Measure 28 fails, 95 million to schools, 35 million to health care, 35 million senior disabled services, certain amount to prisons. I if the measure fails, do you think that there's an argument in terms of trying to restore government credibility to allow those cuts to happen exactly as scheduled? Or do you think that if somebody has a better idea of how to you know, let out fewer prisoners and throw out more old people into the street, that the legislature should go ahead and do that and it won't really have any effect on credibility? Well, you're asking two different questions. One is politics and one is policy. And to answer the policy question, I mean, anything that, from my perspective, that does the least damage to essential state services, is that's appropriate public policy. But when you get to the political question, if your intent is to offer shock value to folks to say, you know what, we weren't kidding. Uh, here we go. And, and to go ahead and cut those programs and see if, you know, people say, fine, you've cut them. It doesn't bother me that much. I guess you've got an answer to your question. Uh, not the answer you want, but an answer. Uh, but if they say, you know what, maybe this wasn't such a hot idea. Maybe we better go back and revisit this question of paying something additional uh, in taxes. Um, Maybe that's worth taking. Maybe maybe that's worth their rethinking on that part. From a from a political point of view, only if it were my call, which it, which it isn't, I'd probably say let the chips fall where they may. If the if the measure loses, make the cuts, and then if the voters decide they can live with those cuts statewide, again, I guess they've made a, a conscious determination that they want less government in their lives. If they decide, you know what, this wasn't such a smart idea, then maybe they'll come back in the other direction. And by the way, I, I'm praising the turtles as well. As I said, I, I don't know what other alternatives you would have had in the broader sense with the Kulingowski campaign. You are much more strategically hamstrung than the other guy because you are as the in party in a, in a year in which people are not very happy with things. So. Bill Savage, City Club member. You, <coughs> you said that the Democrats on the national, speaking on the national basis, um, basically didn't offer a choice, but more of an echo, if I understood you right. I didn't say that. I said a lot of Democrats have oh. that percent. Uh, okay. That's, that is a, an argument that the left wing of the Democratic Party is making, and it, and it may have some validity. I, and, I, and you also said that if the, the, um, if the Democrats move more left, that, that they may have a hard time in the next election. So I'm kind of figuring if you were advising the Democrats as to which direction to go, what, what would you have them do? <laughs> um, my belief is this, and the Repub both parties have learned this at their pain on occasion, politics in the broadest sense in this country is fought in the middle. Le little left to center, a little right to center. That, that, that kind of the, the pendulum oscillates. Sometimes people are a little more conservative, other times a little more liberal. And I guess what I'd say is any party that got too far out of the mainstream, uh, unless the country changed in a radical way, is not going to be a successful party. The Republicans learned that in 1964 when they nominated Barry Goldwater, who offered very much a choice, not an echo. He got 38 percent of the vote. The Democrats offered it in 1972 with George McGovern, a ex highly honorable man, uh, who got 37 and a half percent of the vote and carried one state. Um, uh, and, you know, again, I suspect there are probably not a lot of Ronald Reagan fans in this room, but the reality about Ronald Reagan was he talked a conservative game, but the guy was, uh, was at, on balance, someone who, who governed from the, from the broad middle, not from the extreme uh, right. He may have given re some Republican conservatives the red meat that they enjoyed, uh, but he didn't really govern in that way. He basically governed from a broad center, or he wouldn't have been reelected. Of course, he did have the good fortune of running against Walter Mondale in 1984, but that's another story. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes. Leslie Moorhead, a city club member and member of the newly formed uh, study committee on Measure 28. So here's a me another Measure 28 question. Um, I was going to ask you what you thought the political climate was or the perception was now, and you've answered that question. Um, and we've also talked a lot about the public policy ramifications. So let me phrase this a little different way and see if, if I can understand your thoughts on can you give us the most persuasive argument for and against Measure 28, and who are the constituencies for, that must be persuaded with both arguments? It's a good question. Um, the most persuasive argument for is to link the cuts to education. That's the thing that worries people the most. I'm not saying they're not concerned about the other services, but that's the one where you get the strongest argument. Is that a true statement? Is that true? I'm not, the, I'm not the right person to ask. I'm the only political hack. I'm okay. not a policy guy. I, mean, I don't know if it's true or not. That, okay. that, but I, what I can tell you is that's what the voters believe. Those are the cuts they're most worried about. They're worried. They, it, and, you know, Noah, so that would be my observation on that. Now, the second 
uh, what would be the most cogent argument against, against it? it? Well, uh, the, you know, the government itself has made that argument repeatedly. I mean, we may remember we had a school chief here who said with Measure 5 that if we passed this measure, I'd have to pink slip every, every teacher in the district. Any of you remember that one? Mm -hmm. Measure 5, 19, didn't happen. So when that happens, vote, government undermines what is already, to put it mildly, uh, not the highest level of credibility. Uh, people say, well, they said this was going to happen and it didn't happen, so obviously they're full of baloney. And if I were running the campaign against it, which I'm not, that'd be the argument I'd make. Wouldn't be the argument to say, consciously cut your government, because a lot of folks I don't think would be hugely enthusiastic uh, about, the, are going to be that enthusiastic about these cuts if they actually happen. But if you're asking me short term politically, from a tactical political point of view, what argument would I use? The argument would be, you know, every time they try to scare the pants off of you and claim that all these cuts are going to take place in the world as we know it and Oregon is going to come to an end, it's baloney. They said it in 1990 when Measure 5 passed. They said it in 1996 when, what, 47 or whatever it was passed. And so that's the argument I'd use. So is there a difference in the constituencies then for these that will welcome these arguments or need to be persuaded to vote differently based on these arguments? Is it geographic, demographic, or is it really statewide that the there, battle there, will rate? There are some differences. I mean, the urbanized areas, I think, are going to be more supportive in all probability of the, uh, or at least potentially more supportive of this increase. I think women will be potentially more supportive of this increase than men, but I don't think it's going to be a, a Grand Canyon type gender gap. I think there will be one. Women, from the polling we've done over the years, are more concerned, a little more concerned than men about preserving some of these services, or more inclined to believe they'll be genuine hurt if they're cut uh, than men are. Um, you'll see some, di again, some difference by, uh, uh, not some, but dramatic difference by party. Uh, the polls that we've done that have been publicly released show the Republicans, registered Republicans oppose the increase three or four to one. Democrats only oppose it by five or ten points. Uh, so, that's, that's what some of what we see. Chris Taylor, City Club member. One thing you didn't mention, Tim, is conventional political wisdom would be when people are frustrated with the legislature, the parties that are in control will suffer. And given that we had five special sessions that failed to resolve the budget, I would have expected some kind of a backlash. How, how would you explain that? I am that? surprised by that. Uh, I really thought there'd be more. Uh, and, and from the polling we did, to the degree that voters blamed one party or the other, they blamed the Republicans slightly more than the Democrats, although don't misread what I'm saying, neither party was exactly covered in glory uh, by, by the voters. Um, the best thing I can attribute it to, Chris, is that the Republicans must have had a better ground game going in those individual districts where it was fought out, and it was not a district, or it was not an election that became, uh, if I could use the analogy, nationalized on a, on a state basis. Basically, if the Democrats could have said the Republicans have done a terrible job running uh, the state legislature, we need to make a switch. I don't think they were able to do that. I think what ultimately wa happened was, and it's just a, a, guess, a guess but an educated one, is most voters may have said, eh, the legislature's full of, full of bums like it always is, but my bum's okay. So I'll stay, you know, I'll stay with that individual. I think that may have tamped down the, uh, the, 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 the potential losses or changes. But I was a little surprised. I thought in September there might be more potential uh, for, more t for more turmoil in terms of uh, party switch uh, than we, we, we actually wound up getting. Sal Kadri, City Club member. My question is relating to measure number 14, which had uh, the amend the Constitution to remove the historic uh, references. Yes. Uh, racial references. Yes. Uh, I noticed that uh, overall 29% or 330,000 people in Oregon said no to that change. And if you look at by county, uh, some in counties like Coos and Crook and Mahler said no more than 40% of the time. Can you comment on that as to why that is still prevalent in Oregon? Well, I think if your interpretation is that 40% is that of the voters in those counties uh, actually wanted that in the Constitution, I think you're misreading it. What I will say is there are a core of voters who vote no on anything presented to them doesn't matter what it is. Now, let me be also clear that there are racists in Oregon, and there are going to be some voters who, uh, this is a nice, you know, in the secrecy of the returning the ballot, they can express whatever racial, uh, racist views they have by voting no on this. But I also have to tell you, I think, it, for the most part, probably what you had is people saying, I'm not, I, I don't want to make any changes, I'm voting no on everything, probably didn't even look at it just punch, automatically punched it. That is, a lot of those no voters uh, punched the no ballot. Uh, but again, I, I would also acknowledge it's an easy way for those who hold racist attitudes to, to, uh, to say, to express that 
uh, in the privacy of their own home or the privacy of their own ballot. But I wouldn't interpret that as meaning 29% of the voters. I'd be fun if we could go back out and do a survey and actually ask people if they knew what they voted for, if they understood what it, the, casting a no vote on that meant. And I think probably for some of those voters, they'd be pretty, pretty shocked at what they voted no on. Would that be a good one for City Club to study with your help? That's not a sales pitch yeah. on your no, part. No, no, you know, the, I don't know, maybe. Hi, Tim. Yeah. Kurt Weibring, a member. Um, uh, ballot measure 2633 was a children's agenda, $10 million a year for five years um, for proven children's programs. Uh, what do you read into it is that it, first of all, that it passed, it had no opposition. Um, do you think these, this is something that could be done in other communities, for example? Not a, uh, Try taking that to uh, uh, Pendleton and getting it passed. Um, it wouldn't happen. Um, I, I, and uh, you know that measure passed with a considerably smaller vote than the other two that library levy, but it did get through. And I think to me it's more of an indication of the fact, unlike voters in much, if not most, of the rest of the state, people who live in Portland are willing to tax it more, much more willing to tax themselves uh, for uh, for increased public services. Um, Portland's liberal, a lot of the rest of the state's not, and I think that's what it comes down to. Yes. Gina Mattiota, City Club member. In your comments, you had talked about how redistricting didn't help the Democrats as much. Can you elaborate on that, um, your rationale for? Or well, I, I would have expected they would have picked up some more seats. I mean, uh, and I, mm -hmm. by the way, this is meant as a compliment to the Secretary of State's office that they actually right. got that redistricting plan through. Mm -hmm. It was It was the most, without any doubt, the most partisan redistricting plan I've ever seen in mm -hmm. Oregon. Um, and, uh, and for that reason, why not more? Uh, I think uh, I, I can't answer that question, but it's clear it did not help them as much. Now, let me say this, though. It might wind up helping them an election or two down the line. Sometimes you don't get the immediate benefits, but two or four years down the line, uh, it could be a different story. But I, you know, it's amazing how many districts they managed to get up into Multnomah County. It was pretty remarkable, <laughs> or at least portions of it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, Susan Pierce, uh, member. Going back to the national level, you spoke a bit about the um, risks and effects of um, people's physical safety since September 11th. Mm -hmm. But there's another um, effect of that, and that's kind of a backlash, what I would call a backlash, and, and many people are concerned about the changes in, in blurring the balance of power between uh, the president and Congress and um, changes in some personal freedoms that have come out of that in, in the name of um, safety in the United States. I'm not saying this very well, but can you comment on that and the effect of that? Well, I don't think that, frankly, it was that great. Evidently, not that many people are worried about it, and I'm not saying whether they should or shouldn't be. Uh, I think the folks who are primarily worried about it are are uh, the ACLU and libertarians on the other side. I don't, I don't frankly see that in the in the general public right now. That's probably not the answer you wanted. And what about the other possibly, possibly. I mean, it clearly depends on what kind of measures are taken. I think there are certain things Americans will stand for, and and to make themselves safer. I think there are certain things they won't stand for. I'm not sure exactly what those are, but I think if we get to a point where people feel like. Uh, the government has become too repressive or what, what's being done is dangerous, I suspect the voters will let the politicians know that, that enough is enough. But, but I, don't see a, I, I don't see that it frankly played much of a role this time. Yes, sir. Uh, Mark Peterson, uh, club member. Uh, I want to talk, ask about the health plan, and I'm just wondering, uh, do you think there's significant uh, uh, support statewide to, uh, for a, a significant change in, in health care? I think that people are frustrated with the system, but I don't think there's a consensus as to what ought to be done. It's kind of like tax reform in Oregon. When we ask, well, how, how satisfied are you with the tax system, 90% say they're dissatisfied. Then you start asking, well, what would you like to do? Well, some people actually want to increase income taxes. Some want to cut income taxes. Some want a sales tax. Some want to cut property taxes if, an, if a sales tax is instituted. There's no policy consensus for tax reform, even though there is a, yeah, we want tax reform. There, there's a strong sense that we need tax reform, but there's no policy consensus. And probably you find the same thing with the uh, health care issue. It's very clear. You know, money played a role in, in that, uh, clearly, the, the size of the margin of that. But I have to tell you, the most, most liberal individual in our office, we do have a variety of perspectives, called it a Stalinist health plan and voted against it. So when I saw that, I, I figured the thing was probably, probably doomed. Um, so. 
I am, by the way, for the record, I'm not the most liberal person in our office. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Pat Rumor, City Club member. And my question, Tim, is really that you didn't comment at all on the city council race, so I would like you to do an analysis. Uh, we saw a pretty lively debate here uh, about a month or so ago on uh, what, what happened between the Serena Cruz and Randy Leonard. And then also, looking in your crystal ball, what you think that will mean in terms of the balance on the city council. The mayor was here and is gone, but um, it probably will- probably didn't want to hear it. Right, will bring a new person and what, yeah. you know, think, do you think Randy will really, quote, deliver on what he said he would do? I can't, you know, I can't answer the second part of that. Again, I remind you, I'm a policy hack, or po political hack, and not a policy person. But what I would say it was a, it was a it turned out to be a relatively close race. The difference was, I believe, 54 to 46 percent. Um, the uh, primary gave him about a four point to five point edge. I think normally in primary races, though, the person who wins that primary. You, uh, who, even if they don't get 50% plus one and go to a runoff, usually win in the general election. So I thought that he was the favorite, uh, that polls that we had done privately had him ahead, not by a large margin, but by, you know, kind of a, uh, he, he had something of a lead. So the, the eight point spread, did, the race didn't surprise me at all, the outcome of it uh, didn't. In terms of what his impact will be on the city council, I think it's pretty clear. The only thing I'll say is it clearly stylistically he's different from the remainder of the, the council members, and I suspect that will lead to some sparks. But as, in terms of what, what he can deliver on and what he's promised, don't know. Cy Cornbrook, City Club member. Yes, sir. Uh, I was on the bus project, and in Clackamas County, I walked an area that was strictly divided. One part were nice homes, and divided from that was a trailer park that was very obviously low income. What I found was that there were quite a few Democratic voters in the nice home area, and about half of the people in the trailer park were registered Republicans. Mm -hmm. And what I was wondering about is, do you find a trend of people voting against their own <laughs> needs, their own, their own well-being? Well, I don't necessarily accept the premise of your question, okay. but I do accept the, the, that, that it used to be Republicans were high income, and Democrats were low income, and that's no longer necessarily the case. A great example is how the Republicans, for example, in the suburban belt around Portland are having a harder and harder time uh, hanging on, uh, even though there are a lot of higher, uh, higher income folks there. I think what the Republican, the mistake the Republican Party has made is they have moved to the right culturally and driven off a lot of those folks who might agree with them on some of the other issues, therefore they're voting more uh, more democratic than they used to. On the, on the flip side, uh, I, c I have less explanation for why, uh, as I said, uh, uh, somebody at, at the lower end of the income scale would vote Republican, except maybe they figure they're going to be wealthy someday and want to keep their taxes low retroactively. Um, Hit the lottery. Okay. Uh, Gil Johnson, yes, sir. City Club member. Um, I want to test out a, a liberal uh, elitist assumption that I, I like maybe those. you have the answer here. Do you, when you survey people, ask them where they get their primary source of election information from print media very often broadcast and all that? Yes, sir. Very often. If you limited it to print media, would the election results be dramatically different? That's, a, that's an interesting question, but I, the answer I'd give you is probably not. Uh, and the reason being that uh, what we see in terms of, of what people use as sources is voters over age 50, 45, and particularly over f age 55, are far more likely to go to a newspaper than people, younger voters aged 18 to 34. And I, by the way, encourage all the young folks here to make sure, I bet you all already do, read the paper. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, and you can learn a lot about government that way. But I, we see fewer and fewer young voters and young people, 18 to 34 or even 45, are using newspaper. They either get all their stuff from television news, some from the internet, which I don't think is a bad way to go, but I think uh, le you see among likely voters that uh, newspaper readership is concentrated among voters uh, in a higher age group. I don't think it would have changed the results, but you brought up an interesting point about different kinds of people using different kinds of, of methods to get uh, information. And yeah. readership It'd be interesting because, you know, you get a little bit more public policy discussion in the newspaper. I agree with that. Other questions? I warn uh, them Ray Polani, a city club member. Hi, Ray. Uh, hi, Tim. Uh, nationally, it seems like uh, the administration is getting ready for another tax cut. 
And um, I wonder, aren't the people concerned about deficit at all? Yes, uh, and when I've seen the polling data I've seen suggest, that, uh, again, that they would rather have uh, that, that the no additional tax cut and holding the deficit than getting an additional tax cut uh, and increasing the deficit. That's the best answer I can give you. Uh, I think the Republicans better calibrate that one very carefully. Uh, people always like to have more money in their pocket, but I think there is an argument again and potential vulnerability on the other side among Republicans uh, of running that deficit up, particularly since it appears we're going to have a you know, pretty activist foreign policy that's going to run, uh, probably cost us some money. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Daisy Storsbach, Lincoln High School Constitution Team. You said, if I heard you correctly, that it was Bush's successful nationalization of the election that resulted in the of the of the federal election of the federal election yes. re that resulted in Republicans gaining Congress in in making some gains. Yes. Yes. Um, how much do you think, taking into the account the effects of September 11th, there was an actual shift to the right in Americans' mindset? Not very much at all. Uh, you you uh, should be, I should be very clear here that I'm not defining the Republicans' electoral victories necessarily as, as a movement to the right. My view is that it was more of a response to Bush's campaigning and to, I think, the, me the message that he delivered, which was not a, a dramatic shift to the right message. His argument was fought out on grounds on things like the Homeland Security Bill, and I'm not here to say that's a good or a bad piece of legislation, but I think they won those battles in the key states that they, that they went, that sent the president into, Minnesota, Georgia, not every battle, but most of them. Colorado was another. They lost in Arkansas. They lost in... Uh, South Dakota it appears. So it wasn't successful everywhere, but I think overall it was margin. It was successful enough to re retake the uh, Senate. But I do not interpret it again as some kind of sharp rightward shift by the electorate. Uh, that's that's not an interpretation uh, that I would agree with. Hi Tim, uh, Michael Van Cleek, City Club member. Uh, my question pretty much dovetails with the question the young woman just asked. <clears throat> The Republicans, when we look at the what actually happened in the election, uh, the Republicans uh, won two Senate seats that were basically challenged by uh, one in Minnesota by a candidate who there was question about whether he even wanted to run and was uh, could have easily been seen as outstretched electorate, and then one in Missouri where you had a candidate who was uh, basically a sympathy choice two years ago, but who had not shown much competence uh, in the Senate. Uh, and then they swung only a few House seats, which could almost be uh, exp almost written right to the, uh, the seats that came in as unoccupied when you look at the numbers. Uh, yet the media message, uh, the media seems to be disproportionately echoing the Republicans and almost calling for a Republican revolution, uh, much similar to the way that they portrayed the elections in 1994. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if you can comment on this or if I'm just, uh, if my eyes are just focusing on the uh, the Republican stuff on the front page and not paying much attention to what's happening. You wouldn't be there. a Democrat, would you? Oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. And let me say, I, respectfully, I haven't seen the Republicans nor have I seen the media trumpet this as a sharp rightward move or some sort of re -ex As I said in my comments, if the Republicans reinterpret this, if the, the Republicans think this is some kind of massive mandate to move to the right, they'll be making the same mistake they made in 1994 when they won a huge number of elections by 51 to 49 percent margin, brought in all these conservative ideologues who seemed to think that they, you know, basically had, had a license to ransack the Capitol and turn the government upside down. And that wasn't what voters were saying. The 1994 election was much more, frankly, a reaction to Bill Clinton, a negative reaction to Bill Clinton and his administration than it was a pro-Republican vote. There were, there were certainly strains of of that in it, uh, a positive aspect for Republicans. I don't see this again. I mean, I th look, there's no other way you can spin it other than it was a good night for the Republicans. I and I think it was a good night for the president. But that doesn't mean I read it as, as there being some kind of sharp rightward shift in the country. They, the, the big story here is they flipped the Senate because they won a couple of seats. Well, how do you think Americans will react, uh, for example, to uh, uh, Trent Lott on Wednesday morning? You know, now that he's going to be back in control of the Senate, on Wednesday morning on NPR, no less, uh, Trent Lott was trumpeting how this election clearly provided a mandate for, uh, for example, the Homeland Security uh, Department to uh, be passed right away and for some aggressive action to be taken on foreign policy. Uh, how do you think Americans are going to react to uh, that sort of politicking that's going to be happening in the next uh, several months? Well, I, look, all, whenever a, a politician wins or their party wins, they always claim it's a mandate, even if they're not. What they say for public consumption and what they do are two different things. Bill Clinton said he had a mandate when he got 43% in 1992, and the voters disabused him of that two years later. Um, so I, don't, I just don't take what Lott says that, that seriously, and if I were you, I wouldn't either. 
We're at the end of our time, unless okay. you've got a quick question. One more. Yeah, we'll take it's this really quick. Here. You bet. Um, Whitney Button, Lincoln High School Constitution team. As my teammate Laura mentioned, there was the youth vote. There was also the children's measure on the ballot, but there wasn't. I don't believe there's anything directly affecting public school budgets. So, what do you foresee as the future for public school budgets in Oregon and in Portland specifically, coming from a public school which has seen the budget cuts and really has hurt us? Uh, what I can tell you is this. I think in some of the areas of the state, again, outside of the Tri-County area, uh, it's going to be tough uh, uh, kind of catch as catch can on those budgets. I think in the city of Portland, there's a better chance than in most other places to pass in, in, in a tax measure related to education. That's the, that's the best answer. It doesn't mean it's a slam dunk or guaranteed, but it's a better angle here or better chance here simply because of the makeup of the electorate here. It's indicated more liberal, more democratic, therefore more pro-tax oriented uh, uh, electorate. So a better chance here than a lot of places. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear those good questions from the Lincoln High School students. Yes. Thanks again. I'm so glad you were here today. And I just have one final comment. Thank you, Tim. But it's kind of interesting in my recent recollection of uh, speakers here at City Club, and I wonder if it's political, that Tim and Governor Kitsab are the ones that wear Levi's. <laughs> Thank you. City Club is adjourned. <laughs>